Well, good morning uh, and a big welcome to the uh, latest in the Knowledge Miles Lecture Series, the 695th Lord Mayor's Lectures. Um, delighted today to be welcoming Dr. Alexandra Rose, Curator of Earth Sciences and Astronomy at the Science Museum, to talk uh, to take us on a tour of London, Science City 1550 to 1800. Um, you'll probably know me, I'm Mike Wardle, I'm Chief Executive at ZN, um, and I'll be uh, chairing uh, the session today. Um, my role really um, is, first of all, to do the introductions and the housekeeping and then get out of the way so that uh, we can hear from uh, Dr. Alexandra Rose. The programme today is quite simple. Uh, after my introduction, we have around 20 minutes for a presentation uh, from Alexandra and then a Q&A session. Um, so the housekeeping bits. So first of all, if you do have a question or an observation or a comment, uh, the way to uh, put that in to the discussion is to find the a question tab on your dashboard, uh, type in your question, that will be come to us uh, and you can do that at any point during the presentation. So uh, if something does strike you, please put a question in. Um, we will be sharing the uh, contact details of anyone who asks questions with Alexander. So if there's a need for any follow up or um, interesting uh, discussions afterwards, that will be enabled. Uh, we are recording the session today. Um, and the recording will be available on our website in um, 24 to 48 hours. So that if you want to go back and uh, watch again, or uh, if you have friends and colleagues who you think might be interested, you'll be able to share the recording with them afterwards. Um, and that's really all by way of introduction and um, setting the scene. But it's a great delight to welcome Dr. Alexandra Rose, Curator of Earth Sciences and Astronomy at the Science Museum, who's going to take us on a tour. Um, Alexandra, over to you. Thank you very much for um, that kind introduction. Um, just give me a moment while I share my slides. Let's hide this. Lovely. Okay, I'm going to assume, unless um, you tell me otherwise, that you can all see that fine. Um, all, all well, Alexandra, thank you. Lovely, <laughs> thank you very much. So, um, thank you all for coming. The subject of this talk today is how early modern London both shaped and was shaped by science. In the city, encounters between avidly curious natural philosophers, talented artisans and practical professionals spawned new knowledge, new technologies and even whole new ways of finding out about the world. In this period, the capital was a hub, just as it is today. People came to London from across Britain, Europe and the world. Some passed through fleetingly and others never left. While there, they exchanged not only money and goods, but also knowledge, skills and ideas. And also, as we will see, activities in London influenced the very way that science was done. Significantly for this story, in this period, London was unique. No other city anywhere in the world united as many functions as London did. It was a capital city, the nation's commercial and financial heart. It was a major manufacturing centre, home to the nation's busiest port and the site of government and the royal court. However, until 1826, London didn't have a university. And in this regard, it was quite unlike other conventionally learned cities like Oxford or Cambridge, Paris or Padua. London science was shaped by the commercial and increasingly imperial interests that preoccupied people in the city. It also demanded the skills of a wide range of people. So the story of science in London is not just the story of a small number of elite men. So over the next few minutes, we're going to go on a tour to visit some of early modern London's scientific sites. We're going to meet some of the people at the heart of scientific London, some of whom you may recognize, um, and others who will probably be less familiar. True to my identity as a museum curator, I'll be using some of the wonderful scientific artefacts that have survived from this period to help tell this story, some of which are preserved in the collections of the Science Museum and other museums around the country. These objects help to reveal different kinds of histories. History of science is conventionally dominated by histories of ideas. But collections of scientific instruments and artefacts often bring into view different kinds of practices and different kinds of people. And this leads us to our very first stop in the city. We arrive at a very characteristic 17th century address, 
the Bull's Head over against St Clement's Church, just outside Temple Bar. And at this address is the workshop of this man, Elias Allen. Allen is a maker of scientific instruments, or to use the term that would have been familiar to people at the time, mathematical instruments. And in this engraved portrait, you could see a miscellany of devices that Allen and his apprentices would have made. These include a calculating instrument known as a sector, a ring dial for time telling, and parts of a theodolite for surveying. You can also see uh, in the background the tools of Allen's trade. He's got dividers in his hand and metalworking and engraving tools on the wall behind. Allen worked in London between 1607 and 1653. He certainly wasn't the only maker of these kinds of devices in the city at the time, but he was the first to be able to make a living solely from the manufacture of mathematical instruments. The few dozen other individuals who participated in this fledgling trade at the time traded in instruments alongside other products, usually engraved items like maps and book plates. Allen therefore speaks to a very particular moment in the history of this specialist trade in scientific instrument making in London. 50 years earlier, anyone needing a measuring or a calculating device would have had to import one from one of the various manufacturing centres in Europe, perhaps Nuremberg or Flanders, or they would have had to commission one from a different kind of artisan, perhaps a, a blacksmith. In the late 16th century, Elizabeth I and her advisors saw an advantage in cultivating a native trade in the precision skills of instrument making. A number of foreign artisans were invited to come to London and to ply their trade, and importantly, to pass on their skills to native makers. One such maker, known as Thomas Gemini, um, had trained in Flanders, but made the sundial that you can see on the top left of this slide whilst he was working in London. In a dedication on a map that he'd engraved, um, he thanked the Queen, saying that he was, I quote, living and being here in your realm of England under your grace's protection. The table clock that you can see below was also made by a Flemish maker living in London, a man called Nicholas Vallin, although he and his whole household sadly died of the plague in 1603. So why would England's rulers be interested in scientific instruments? Well, the answer is that a new preoccupation with precision was changing the practices of many people whose work was fundamental in the expanding city. Geometry was transforming navigation. Now, this was essential for national defence, and you can see in this textbook diagram the application of geometrical principles and scientific instruments in the calculating of distances of ships from the coast. Navigation clearly was also key to trade. Geometry was also transforming architecture, which was a key concern in a rapidly expanding city such as London. And geometry was also transforming surveying, which enabled the accurate measurement of land and estates, helped to establish ownership and could support the collection of tax revenues. At this time, textbooks explaining ge geometrical practice, like the one uh, from which this image is taken, were becoming available in English for the first time. They'd previously only been available in Latin, but now the techniques could be studied and learned by people without elite scholarly training, including the practical professionals who were creating the new London. And crucially for our story, these new techniques demanded new types of instruments for performing calculations, especially of proportion, and for taking measurements, especially of angles. Many of these newly available English textbooks advised their readers where they could purchase the instruments they needed to carry out the techniques in the book. In the early 17th century, um, many directed people to the workshop of our friend, Elias Allen, who was London's most advertised instrument maker at the time. And his workshop wasn't just a manufacturing space either, but a social one. Scholars and mathematicians are known to have visited the workshop and collaborated with Allen over new types of devices and ma mathematical innovations. One known visitor was William Uhtred, who's credited with inventing the slide rule. <laughs> 
this example that you can see on the slide, um, which is in a circular format that predated the more familiar linear slide rule, was made by Elias Allen um, and is preserved today at Cambridge University's Whipple Museum. Allen and his contemporaries had a significant legacy. By 1800, London was renowned amongst the scientific community as the world's leading centre for instrument making which became an ever more specialist and technical trade as people were ever more preoccupied with precision measurement that increasingly dominated science. In particular, this man, Jesse Ramsden, was the superstar of scientific instrument making in the second half of the 18th century. His workshop in Piccadilly employed up to 50 apprentices and journeymen who manufactured everything from small sextants and octants um, for navigation to large bespoke precision hardware, including instruments for the newly founded Ordnance Survey. And you can see the magnificent surveying instrument on the right there. Um, and also a large astronomical circle that was the crowning glory of the observatory in Palermo. Um, and you can see that instrument in the background of the portrait of Ramsden. So from the modest beginnings in Allen's time, London's instrument workshops were the admiration of the world. So we now move on in space and time, and it's the latter half of the 17th century. And appropriately, we now arrive at Gresham College, located between Bishopsgate and what is now Old Broad Street. Stepping into one of the rooms, we find an exclusive meeting. Imagine, if you will, a group of men gathered around the intriguing device on the right, uh, watching carefully, discussing, some making notes and others taking measurements with precision pocket watches and scales. Welcome to a meeting of the Early Royal Society. Initially founded in 1660 and granted their royal charter shortly after, the new society drew together men from a range of different backgrounds and political allegiances, but who were united by a shared passion for championing experiment as a way of finding out about the world. While we take this for granted today as a fundamental attribute of science, it was not always the case. The scholarly tradition of ancient universities taught that knowledge should be acquired by looking for signs that were revealed by God through the movement of planets, weather, animals and plants, and from the conclusions reached through logic and debate. But in contrast, the Royal Society's members, or fellows as they were known, were committed to systematic experiment and empirical observation, epitomised by their motto, nullius in verba, which is usually translated as take nobody's word for it. So the device on the slide here, an air pump, um, was not only a regular feature of, those, of the experiments that took place during Royal Society meetings, but it also became symbolic of their very agenda. The instrument was used for experiments on what we would now call air pressure, but what was then termed the spring of the air. Often led by Robert Boyle, who wrote several books of air pump experiments, fellows placed a range of different objects inside the glass chamber, everything from lit candles to moving machines, glasses of beer and live animals. Cranking the handle either removed the air from the chamber or pumped more air inside. The subsequent effects were watched carefully, timed and chronicled. Accounts of experiments with the air pump and numerous other instruments, both in London and elsewhere, were shared from 1665 in the world's first journal devoted exclusively to experiment and natural philosophy. It was founded by the Royal Society's secretary, Henry Oldenburg, and had the wonderfully unwieldy title, The Philosophical Transactions, giving some account of the present undertakings, studies and labours of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. Still published today, it's also the world's longest running scientific journal. Now, we might well ask why the Royal Society was in London. Why not a more obvious scholarly place such as, say, Oxford? One reason, perhaps, was London's political neutrality in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. But another explanation comes from looking more closely at the air pump itself. This particular one was made in 1709 and is quite an elaborate example, but to make even the simpler earlier versions demanded the artisanal skills of glass blowing, gear cutting and carpentry. Nowhere else in England at the time boasted such a range of craftspeople in such close proximity as London. Experiment demanded instruments 
and instruments required the craft skills to make them. Robert Hooke was the only paid member of the society at the time. As curator of experiments, he was responsible for arranging um, instruments and demonstrations for the fellows. He kept a very detailed diary, which reveals that he spent a huge amount of time visiting the workshops of artisans from textile printers to clockmakers. His work on microscopy, which culminated in his extraordinary work, Micrographia, published in 1665, would not have been possible without his close collaboration with London's expert lens makers. And yet, Londoners concerned above all with business and practical matters were not always the most sympathetic audience for knowledge that lacked obvious real world benefits. In 1676, a satirical play, The Virtuoso, poked fun at the Royal Society's activities through its title character, seen performing a range of seemingly ridiculous far-fetched experiments. While some indeed were fantastical, such as learning to swim on dry land by imitating a frog, most were actually based on real experiments that have been carried out by Royal Society fellows, including terrifyingly the transfusion of blood from a sheep to a man. Hook went to watch the play and it seems he spent much of, his, of the time squirming in his seat, feeling very much the object of ridicule. He wrote in his diary afterwards, damn dogs, they almost pointed. With this in mind, it makes sense just how many of the Royal Society fellows were closely involved in the practical businesses of the city. Even the great Isaac Newton, famous, of course, for his mathematical treatises on gravity and optics that transformed our understanding of the natural world, served as warden and then master of the Royal Mint from 1696. The Mint was based in the Tower of London, and this furnace um, that's now in the Science Museum's collections was used there during the time that Newton was master. Far from just treating the role as a ceremonial one, Newton was hands-on, methodical and pragmatic in his approach. One of his key accomplishments was reducing the counterfeiting of coins by making them harder to forge and disputing successfully a claim by the goldsmiths company that coins that he had produced in 1710 didn't contain enough gold. Amongst the practical endeavours of other fellows were the attempt of William Petty to revolutionise shipbuilding by inventing a catamaran, John Evelyn's treatise on forestry to improve timber supplies to the Navy, and Christopher Wren's involvement in the rebuilding of the city after the Great Fire. But science in London wasn't just the preserve of exclusive audiences such as the Royal Society. During the 18th century especially, uh, there was a proliferation of lectures, demonstrations and dramatic spectacles where a far wider audience could learn about natural philosophy and see its applications in action. Whoops, sorry, I think I've done something bad there. There we go. Um, if we had more time, I would love to tell you um, about the lectures that took place in coffee houses, taverns, um, and purpose built venues across the city, where lecturers would attract spectators with a rich array of demonstration apparatus. We could also talk about the many balloon flights um, that took off from sites around the city, such as the one you can see on the right here that was in St. George's Fields in Southwark. Some of these events attracted Royal Society fellows equipped with quadrants to scrutinise the claims of maverick balloonists that they could steer their balloons using rudders and oars. We could look also at how London's instrument makers diversified their customer base with appealing philosophical contraptions that wealthy amateur buyers could use at home. But let's look at just one example involving the period's most spectacular phenomenon, electricity. In 1778, at the Pantheon, the magnificent dance hall just off Oxford Street, a drama played out very publicly that related to a key debate of the day. For some years, several Royal Society fellows had been engaged in a robust dispute over the question of whether lightning conductors should taper into a sharp point or be topped by a ball, as shown in the demonstration model here. Even though we know now that this makes little difference, the anxiety over the risks is understandable. St Bride's Church had recently lost part of its steeple following a lightning strike, and there were significant fears over the safety of nearby St Paul's. And even more explosively, 
gunpowder stores, such as those at Purfleet. Tired of the verbal debate, one of the protagonists, Benjamin Wilson, installed a giant electrical machine and a miniature model of the Purfleet arsenal in the Pantheon, inviting spectators to come to view a demonstration of the advantages of blunt conductors over pointed ones. Crowds flocked there, tantalised by the pyrotechnics that Wilson laid on to make his point. Matters came to a head when Wilson successfully persuaded King George III of the merits of his lightning conductor design. Having witnessed the Pantheon show, the king declared the conclusions, and I quote, so plain they would convince the Apple women on the street. This caused an outcry. The president of the Royal Society, who was an opponent of Wilson's, was so horrified that he was moved to resign, declaring to the king that his prerogatives do not extend to altering the laws of nature. It is true that politics may have had something to do with this. Wilson's key opponent was Benjamin Franklin. Franklin's fascination with electricity is reflected in the background of this portrait. Um, but at the same time, his pro-American lobbying was ruffling feathers in the British government in the years after the outbreak of the War of Independence. However, this episode shows how scientific spectacle that played out in sites all over London was not just a frivolous sideshow, but fundamental to practical and intellectual questions of the time. So we've visited a number of London scientific sites, and I want to close with perhaps the most striking testament to the importance of science in London in this period. I'm talking about the monument. Familiar to us all as a monument to the Great Fire, it was designed by our friends Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren, who planned to use it as a telescope. Its cellar observing room still survives at the base, although not usually publicly accessible. Um, and the structure would have had lenses fitted inside the central shaft. Its purpose was to observe certain stars tracking directly overhead with the intention of demonstrating stellar parallax, which is a phenomenon resulting from the heliocentric, sun-centered arrangement of the solar system. Although this model of the universe had been widely accepted for some time by the mid 17th century, it was notoriously tricky to point to empirical evidence that it was so. Unfortunately, even at this time, the heavy traffic streaming past the structure, which Hook referred to as the Fish Street Pillar, caused sufficient vibration to disrupt Hook's observations. The monument, however, did prove useful for other kinds of experiments. Papers in the Philosophical Transactions describe fellows carrying portable barometers up and down the monument to take readings of air pressure. Hook had strategically ensured that each of the monument's several hundred steps were exactly six inches high, making these height observations efficient and easy. I can think of no greater symbol of the importance of science in early modern London than this, that right in the heart of the city's bustling commercial district stands proud a giant scientific instrument. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and if you've enjoyed this talk, do please come and visit the Science Museum's Science City Gallery, where you can see some of the wonderful artifacts that I've um, shown in this talk, uh, along with many others. Um, but for now, Thank you so much for listening and um, I'll be delighted to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alessandra. It's a, <clears throat> a great overview. Um, Clyde Bullen has uh, commented, he said, it's very interesting. I'm just wondering whether there's areas you'd recommend that people should walk around in London to find out more and any guides that would help know what there was on the walk. I mean, so is there a, a scientific walk around London, maybe starting and ending at the monument, who knows? <laughs> Goodness, that's such a great question. Um, I know that there are some people who I think who, who do run this kind of thing. The names escape me, but if there's a, f you mentioned there would be a follow up, I can maybe do a little bit of digging because I'm sure that does exist, but I, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure exactly who runs them. I know in well, the museum we 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 had hoped to create something, but in the end we uh, we ran out of time, so we didn't as part of our project. But. Um, um, well, yeah. uh, we, we have one of our audience, uh, Lawrence Scales, um, who has commented, I give scientific history tours, he says. Um, if it's all right with Lawrence, I shall put uh, your um, email into the chat. 
Um, so if you could just um, let me know through uh, putting a comment in the questions. Um, and so anyone who's interested uh, will be able to get in touch and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, take, uh, and take a look at what you do. Um, yeah, John Wood has um, just asked about the terms science and scientists. I mean, in their in their current definition and narrow definition, they're fairly recent. Uh, you mentioned mathematicians and natural philosophers. Was there any more general term for those who are involved that they use between themselves? I mean, you know, what, what would such people call themselves? Yeah, no, that's a really great question, and I you'll notice that I sort of dodged my way through that without addressing it directly in my talk. Um, yeah, I mean, I've referred to science here. I mean, actually, in this period, the term science was a much more general one that kind of referred to all knowledge rather than being more specifically what we think of as science today. Um, the two main um, uh, sort of practices or domains were practical mathematics, which covered things like astronomy, navigation, surveying, all of these kinds of measuring and calculating uh, activities and natural philosophy, um, natural philosophy being, you know, lines of inquiry about, you know, how the world works and the causes of underlying causes of things, whereas practical mathematics was much more about um, doing practical calculations that helped you achieve things to a practical end. Um, you know, famously, Isaac Newton sort of brings those two practices together um, in his in his Principia, um, which was a sort of far more radical statement, I think, than people often realise the idea that you could use mathematics in the service of natural philosophy. Um, the word scientists is is considerably later. I hope I didn't accidentally say scientists in this uh, in this talk because that would be inappropriate. The word wasn't even invented until 1833 um, and was very unpopular for quite a long time. Um, because of it sounded a bit like dentist or it sounded like an Americanism and, and people were sort of very, um, uh, yeah, uh, sort of quite hostile to that term initially. Um, so yes, people would have used the terms um, practical mathematicians and natural philosophers primarily. Thank you. Um, Graham Elliott's asked, um, given London's dense population, um, do you know whether there was much effort put into health related science aimed at better hygiene um, at this period? I mean, obviously, later on, it certainly was, but was, did it start in this period? Um, yes, that's uh, that definitely is the case. I mean, I haven't really sort of touched on that. My, my expertise is much more in the sort of physical sciences. But yes, those sorts of inquiries were beginning. There's a lot of discussions in um, in the Royal Society, actually, about things that we would now kind of consider, you know, biological um, and, uh, you know, sort of health related things, both, I suppose, in, um, yeah, in relation to uh, the health of, you know, people in London and in, in England, but also, you know, as, as um, uh, you know, the sort of, you um, imperial and colonial agenda and the health of people you know traveling elsewhere as well um, and the you know effect of different climates and things like that so yes that absolutely was a um was a key concern and the um the philosophical transactions um of this period show just kind of how wide-ranging the um the royal society's interests were like it certainly wasn't limited um solely to what we would now think of as kind of physical sciences sure. Um, Dan Feeney's just asked how much uh, science versus religious kind of strife did London face in these times? Um, you know, was there a um, same difficulty as Galileo had had, for example, um, in making scientific inquiries? Yeah, I, I don't believe so. I think in this period, um, you know, th that there wasn't that same sense of conflict in the main because um, to most people the study of the natural world was in itself a kind of act of worship. Um, so I think the sense that those two practices were in conflict was a much actually a, in general a, a kind of later um, uh, phenomenon I think. Um, I, I'm certainly not aware of any instances you know such as Galileo that, um, in, in this in this period for of the protagonists um in London anyway. 
Thank you. Um, John Willis wondered, he said he knows that he, Newton and Hook didn't get on, um, but Hook worked with Wren. Do, do we know anything what Wren's relationship with Newton was like? <laughs> oh, goodness, the, tri the triangulation. Um, I I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. It's sometimes a bit difficult to unpick these sort of interpersonal relationships. Um, obviously, when they become very hostile, as, as Hook and Newton's did, then it sort of all um, spills spills out and we become aware of it. But, um, you know, it, in the main, I think there was more of a sort of spirit of, of, of collaboration. Um, but yes, I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. I might have to go and uh, check that one out afterwards. <laughs> we'll make sure you're in touch afterwards so that uh, yeah. if you, if you do, find, do find an answer or some, some, some hints, then you could, um, you could correspond. Um, Thomas Walford um, mentioned that you haven't, you didn't mention Harrison um, and his clock. Um, you know, and what, but his question is, how much of the serious, serious scientific progress uh, was based on what, what was going on outside London? perhaps funded by a forward-looking government based in London. So there was you know, things going on in London, but how much was, was that spread into the regions? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I suppose I sort of, yeah, in terms of the, uh, the the geographical elements of it, I mean, I think that thinking of London as a hub is, you know, absolutely crucial. It's not that everything was happening in London, obviously, but I think what made London interesting and, and, and special and what makes it interesting to think about in terms of I suppose it's that this story's contemporary relevance is that people were coming in and out because of the specific the particular breadth and depth of skills and resources um, that were available um, in in London um, so yes there was a kind of a, a, a spreading out and especially towards the end of the period as you know with the kind of rise of um, you know, northern industrial cities, for example, um, you know, the, the, the geographical kind of picture does change and there's a bit of a shift in the sort of centre of, of gravity, certainly. Um, yeah, but that said, even some of the projects that happened sort of technically beyond London um, were like often the connection to London, both the geographical connection and also the sort of broader networks were really key. So I'm thinking here about the Ordnance Survey, um, which was founded in the 1790s. And the initial step of that project to sort of measure the baseline um, took place at Hounslow Heath. So, I mean, technically at the time, you probably wouldn't have called, termed that as like within the boundaries of London, although we might do today. Um, but proximity to London and the need to get bespoke hardware and people and resources um, to that site from London was was a really key reason why that site was chosen. Um, so, you know, yes, obviously it's it's not a straightforward uh, um, story in a sense, but I think you know there, the importance of London does come through even in projects that that. That kind of are situated elsewhere. Thank you very much. Um, so, Kratu Andil Bhav has asked um, whether you can comment on the possible influence of the work of John Dee, uh, his work on magic and the search for the language of the universe, um, on the on the development of um, the kinds of work that you've been talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, a little bit. I'm not. I'm not an expert in D actually, but he's certainly a really interesting figure in the sort of, um, uh, the, yeah, the, the types of study that he's um, that he's doing are, are a really important kind of, you know, prelude and early influence on this. But um, yeah, I, 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 I might need to come back to you on that one on the specifics. Well, I think it's it's always important to remember that Newton did as much alchemy and wrote more actually on alchemy than he did on um, natural science. Um, yeah, and that's that absolutely was an influence true. that came exactly through that that lineage. Yeah, um, no, that's absolutely true. There's definitely more. We can't look at this period and sort of apply the same um, kind of disciplinary boundaries, and certainly those boundaries between what we now think of as pseudoscience and real science. Um, you know, that we have to be sensitive to the, um, you know, to to what these people were trying to do.
Um, Thomas Wolf has asked a question of how much progress in this area was government funded? And in my sense, is not a lot at all, but uh, you might know better. Um, yeah, no, that's that's right. It wasn't it wasn't heavily government funded, that sort of large scale sort of state um, support of science was really a more of a 20th century um, phenomenon sort of start with its roots kind of in the in the late 19th century but but that said I mean the crown was hugely important and um, especially in the later 18th century the the presence of George III as a um, you know real patron and enthusiast of science was really really key um, so in you know he, he funded um, projects like the Ordnance Survey and um, uh, the transit of Venus uh, observations um, by James Cook and so on and so forth. So he was very involved uh, in promoting um, sort of national scientific agenda, if you like to be slightly anachronistic about it. But um, <laughs> yeah, that kind of patronage was really important, but it wasn't coming from government in quite the same way that we might think of it now. And just, just return to the, the question of sort of biological sciences, just a comment really, uh, Lawrence Scales, who does the scientific walks around London, commented that Richard Mead, who was Newton's physician, was a fellow of the Royal Society, and William Stukeley wrote a treatise on the spleen, was also another member of the Royal Society. So there was, certainly was interest mm. in biological sciences at the time. It may not have been so much about population, but it was um, very, yes. very interested. Yeah, that's true. And a, a lot of the, I mean, People who were fellows of the Royal Society were sort of coming from different, you know, had different you know, professions, but a lot of them were physicians. Um, so there would have been a lot of people like bringing that knowledge to the Royal Society in that period. Yeah. Uh, Sean Turnbull's asked about you know, the government's providing a cash prize for developing an accurate seafaring chronometer. Um, and was that sort of the, really the first example of you know, government support for this kind of work? After the um, service. Yeah, that's that's a good point. The um, the, the board of longitude uh, in in the mid eighteenth century, um, you know, to to solve that really core, really important practical question um, of how to determine longitude at sea, um, was a you know really interesting example. I probably the first. I would need to check that, but yes, um, yeah. And I think uh, you know, and Harrison was mentioned earlier, and. Um, you know, we often sort of think of, of the Harrison aspect of that story, but it's, you know, it's, su it's a much broader story than that, actually. And there were a lot more financial awards um, made under the Board of Longitude than um, sometimes w w we might remember. So I showed a, a, a picture of Jesse Ramsden, that, that portrait. Um, I mean, he was one of the beneficiaries of Board of Longitude um, of money. Um, and his particular innovation was the invention of the dividing engine, which was the slightly curious contraption in the foreground of that portrait. Um, and that uh, partially automated and sped up the production of sextants and octants. So obviously really key navigational devices um, and essential for like the rival method to the Harrison chronometers, the lunar distance method, um, because, you know, while Harrison had, um, you know, obviously come up with this extraordinary technical solution um, to this key uh, scientific question, um, actually the marine chronometers weren't all that affordable for most navigators until um, this sort of well into the 19th century, actually. So sextants and octants are hugely important. Um, so yeah, there, there were sort of other other beneficiaries of, of that um, of that sponsorship. Um, Hugh Purse has asked whether intellectual property laws had any impact on scientific discovery during this period. Um, were they developing, were they having an impact? So I, I don't believe so. I think the sort of what we would now think of as any, any intellectual property um, you know kind of legal frameworks and things were, were much later um there there were it was much more about well the kind of difficult interplay between secrecy in the trade and sort of productive collaboration um there were definitely instances of essentially like industrial espionage where people would 
you know come from different maybe different European centres or even perhaps within um, within the country and like uh, be apprenticed maybe to um, to somebody and then be kind of trying to steal the the secrets of the trade or you know to to sort of um, find out more about what was going on in particular workshops and things like that that was definitely going on so it, but it was I don't think there were the same you know there weren't legal um, ramifications to that um, in the same way. Thank you. Um, Ian Harris, um, one of my colleagues at ZN, has asked a question of, um, first of all, says super talk. Um, what lessons do you think we can learn from the history of scientific development to inform policy for the future of scientific development in London? Um, are there things that you think we can learn from this period in history? Yeah, that's a really nice question. I mean, I think I think one of the things that that history can tell us about science is that science isn't just a kind of abstract body of knowledge and it doesn't happen in a vacuum, but that, you know, these geographical characteristics of a place, both you know, human and physical geographical, do have an influence on the kinds of questions people are asking and the kinds of methods that they have available to answer questions. So, you know, just in the same way that, um, you know, in this period, London is drawing, you know, talent and skills and resources, um, you know, and that that being the reason why people wanted to come and, uh, you know, and collaborate. And also the institutions that were there that sort of fostered that collaboration, you know, that those those were so important then. And it seems like, you know, that that feels like an important lesson for um, for today as well. Thank you. Um, Carol Sosinski has asked whether there was any interest in the military and science in this period, thinking in particular of artillery development. And obviously the Ordnance Survey was set up for you know, military purposes. Um, but do we know of other sort of military interest? Yes, I mean, a lot of these practical mathematical techniques, um, you know, the things like, you know, the military surveying, obviously, and study of ballistics and, and all of these kinds of things. That, yeah, it was absolutely. It was a really fundamental application of practical mathematics, definitely, like the whole way through the period, certainly. Um, in the Science Museum's collections, we've got, you know, a huge array in the sort of mathematics collection of, of devices that would have been used in a military context. So like gunners, rules and, um, you know, instrument, you know, yeah, like I say, sort of military surveying um, devices and things. So, yeah, it was it was absolutely one of the core um, contexts in which that uh, those kinds of techniques would have been used. And we're sort of coming to the end of time, but I just don't wonder whether I mean the, the original journal um, that you mentioned, the original scientific journal, whose title I can't remember, um, <laughs> it went on for rather a while. But my understanding is that that involved quite a lot of publication of correspondence from scientists on the on the continent, and you know, London's place as a hub for bringing together scientific um, development from across the continent was quite important. Um, do you have, have any further insights on that? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. You know, correspondence networks, as well as kind of, um, you know, phys people physically traveling um, was really key. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, yeah, certainly the sort of the individuals like Henry Oldenburg at the heart of those networks were really, really important for drawing knowledge together. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that maybe we're, you know, which I've sort of tried to stress in my talk a bit was like the importance of the instrument making trade as well. So there's lots of accounts of um, of uh, individuals from uh, scholars from across Europe coming to London specifically to visit the instrument making shops, which I think is really mm -hmm. lovely um, and sort of, you know, right, keeping journals of like their experiences, um, you know, visiting those makers and purchasing things because London was seen at the especially in the 18th century as like the place to come for scientific equipment. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's a sort of another dimension of that transfer of, you know, knowledge, yes, ideas, yes, but also th things and tools and skills. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. thank you very much. We've come to the end um, of our session. Uh, just time to mention Sean Turnbull's 
uh, just put a comment in just noting that the sovereign did authorize patents to protect the exploitation of intellectual property uh, to some extent so i think that's the beginnings maybe of um, intellectual property law um <clears throat> just remains for me to um conclude um uh, first of all let's take a look forward um on thursday a session on um, how will we be long? How can a piece of music help us think about the next thousand years? And those of you who know about Long Player in Greenwich um, will be, be interested in that. Uh, next week, personal reflections on using management insights from physics and economics to approach societal challenges. Uh, and, and a session on the Thames barrier, its immediate future or long past. So plenty of content uh, coming up in this series um, and we look forward very much to seeing you again. Um, it just remains for me to thank you all for coming along today, and, but in particular to thank uh, Dr. Alexandra Rose uh, for a fascinating uh, oversight. Um, we very much look forward to it and do go to the exhibition um, if you have the opportunity and you're in London uh, and able to get to South Kensington. So thank you very much all um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.